was 1947. We had come out of World War II a prosperous and powerful nation, and the market for electricity was primed to explode. Everybody knows that electricity lights the house, makes the toast, shaves your face, wakes you up, cooks the food, runs the radio. But what was promoted as a luxury 50 years ago is so commonplace today, we don't even think about it. In New York City alone, electricity powers the lives of 8 million people. 6 million ride the subway every day. Eleven thousand lights direct traffic. We don't realize how dependent we are on electricity until it's gone. At 4.11 in the afternoon, August 14, 2003, the most powerful city in the world went dark. For 24 hours, New Yorkers found out what life was like before the convenience of electricity. No air conditioning to battle the 92 degree heat. No subways to take you home. People stranded. Cars traffic jammed. No refrigerators. No telephones. No alarm clocks. No street lamps. But how did it happen? The problem is twofold. An antiquated grid and the electricity that travels through it. Bringing power to our television, our microwaves. First, the light bulb. October, 1879. Thomas Alva Edison perfects the electric light. He wasn't the first to try. Inventors in 21 countries had been working on light systems for five decades. But he was the first to succeed in getting it to last 40 hours twice as long as any other bulb on the market. Just one problem. Without a system to distribute power to it, Edison's bulb was useless. What is incredible and what is most amazing about the Edison incandescent light system is its vast range. Because not only did they develop a working incandescent light, but an entire network to support it. Edison comes up with that concept of, of a network, a power distribution system, the three-wire system, the fuses, even that silly meter that charges you the money. Three years later, Edison opened the first commercial electric power plant in the country, the Pearl Street Central Power Station, which lit 800 light bulbs in New York City. Six coal-fired generators sent power into the direct current system, known as DC. But the problem with DC is transmission, only customers within a mile could receive electricity from Pearl Street. Edison's answer was build a power station every mile. It wasn't really the best of ideas. Um, but uh, slowly but surely, Edison starts losing in this battle. A battle fought with his protege turned rival, Nikola Tesla. Tesla was a genius. Not too much on personality, but genius. Now, Edison is irreverent. Edison loves to tweak you a little bit. Edison loves to play with you a little bit. And so when he meets Tesla, he says, yeah, how do you do? I'll give you $50,000 if you can develop a system better than DC, wink. Tesla goes to work perfecting the AC system. And Edison does not like AC too much. And so Tesla develops his AC system and his lighting system and does a private demonstration for Edison, works fine, and says to Mr. Edison, I'm ready for my $50,000. And Edison kind of looks at him and says, I guess you don't understand Yankee humor, do you? <laughs> and, of course, Tesla's not exactly enthralled with this. But George Westinghouse, Edison's main competitor, was. He quickly recruited Tesla and his alternating current system. Together, they began building a network where a few far-off power plants would distribute electricity to America's cities and towns. The electric age was underway. Today's power transmission system, the grid, is a direct descendant of the Tesla Westinghouse plan. Since the turn of the century, it's worked pretty well. But the blackouts show that the system is antiquated, stressed, and may soon become inadequate to meet our needs. The grid pools electric resources by linking power plants together. That way, if one has a problem, another plant can fill in. 
But when the blackout happened, this very strength made it vulnerable. A power surge in Ohio caused a chain reaction, tripping plants offline and thrusting millions of homes into darkness. This is the New York State Independent System Operator, also known as the ISO, the traffic cop that monitors and redirects power coming in from plants as far away as Canada. They say that rising demand for electricity over the next several years will test the grid's limit. Right now, we get electricity from several sources, ranging from those that pollute, like coal and other fossil fuels, to those that are clean and renewable, like the sun and the wind. Coal is America's single largest source for electricity, and it will be used to meet growing demand. Natural gas will follow close behind. This means carbon dioxide emissions will grow as well. Attractive pricing made natural gas the fuel of choice for virtually all new power plants built in the last few years. Ken Clapp of the independent system operator says this is reason for concern. And we have to be weary of the fact that you don't want to become overly dependent upon any, any one source. And as time goes on, uh, we will be burning, or at least on paper, it looks like we will be burning quite a bit of natural gas in the future. And we have to be concerned as to whether those supplies will, will always be there at a reasonable cost. While it's the most efficient and cleanest of the fossil fuels, releasing less carbon dioxide and fewer pollutants into the air, supplies are in question and prices are as unpredictable as the stock market. The Department of Energy says in their annual energy outlook that energy markets are random and cannot be anticipated. They say that prices can be affected by unforeseeable events like weather, politics, and technology. This graph compares prices of natural gas in red and wind in green over the past few years. Major events like the Enron scandal and the war in Iraq drove gas prices up but had no effect on wind. When you look at some of the spikes in the cost of natural gas and compare those to the cost of power from wind, definitely uh, there's, there's a cost, an advantage to getting more electricity from wind. Wind power has become the most competitive renewable source for electricity, and in fact, since 1990, it's been the fastest growing power source worldwide. In Madison County, New York, about 30 miles from Syracuse, is a dairy farm of 150 cows. Bonnie and Carl Stone earn their living selling milk. They pick our milk up every day out of there. But times are tough, so now they're selling wind. I just love to stand under them and hear them. Just this gentle whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. The Stones Farm has seven wind turbines. They've been feeding electricity into the New York grid for four years. Each turbine stands 215 feet tall, and together they power more than 3,000 homes. The land they're built on has been in Carl's family for three generations. The first time that the bulldozers pulled in and, and they were working, he stood up there and he looked across the hill and the valley, and the tears ran down his face. And he said, what am I doing to my father's farm? It was, it was like they were, they were digging in my own guts because I was, I was, I was that passionate about this land that, that was my father's and now was mine. And, but uh, uh, once I saw the finished project and I saw the good it was doing and I, and I felt the support of the uh, community around me and, uh, and, the, and the people that, uh, that believed in the, Renewable energy, uh, yeah, it's a good thing, and uh, my, uh, my dad would be proud. The man behind the Madison project was Bill Moore, co-owner of Atlantic Renewable Energy Corporation. With Carl and Bonnie Stone, he built the first wind farm east of the Mississippi. This is something I've wanted to do since I was 18 years old. And, you know, if, if you take global warming seriously, we don't really have a lot of options. You know, second only to energy efficiency, you know, new wind is really the only, only way we can, uh, in the near term, have a big impact on our emissions of global warming gases, greenhouse gases. Madison, Moore's first wind project, was given the green light in the spring of 2000 
after several years of testing and planning. On May 1st, they pulled in with their backhoes and bulldozers and, and started construction. These uh, wind turbines are essentially prefabricated. They come out here by truck, we lift them up in place with a large crane and bolt them together and plug them in. You know, the, it's a lot simpler than actually building a new uh, central station uh, conventional power plant that has all kinds of customized work that takes place right on the site. Up and running, their new wind farm became a 21st century cash crop bringing additional income to their traditional farming. Dairy farming and wind turbines make really good partners because they don't interfere with each other. We can still farm it right up to the base of each of the turbines and the cows pay no attention to them whatsoever. And farming's really tough right now and any little bit that you can get revenue from your land is, is certainly a big help. And obviously you're going to go get more from the revenues that the wind produces in that 14-foot circle than you'd ever get from the corn that grows there. Uh, there are those that, that think that it, it changed us uh, tremendously financially and that now we are uh, windmill millionaires, you know, uh, so to speak. Uh, that's not the case. The dairy business has been on a, you know, a st steady downward decline for, for generations, really, and I think that a lot of the farmers that are up here now are just barely holding on by the skin of their teeth, you know, with milk prices where they are. So it's, um, you know, installing a wind farm is, is, is a terrific kind of uh, economic development benefit for the local landowners and local towns. These wind projects provide local jobs during construction and boost tax revenues for the community. The Madison project has paved the way for other developments across the Northeast. About a half hour away, the Fenner Project is a group of nine landowners who share 20 wind turbines, making it New York's largest wind farm. Thirty years ago when we bought this farm, you know, I told my wife if we could capture the wind and the water on this hill, it would be worth more than the farm. Scott Griffin and his wife Donna have two turbines on their property. The windmill behind the barn is, is ours and the first one in the woods is ours. The Griffin's windmills alone make enough electricity for 900 homes. As the wind blows, it sets the blades into motion, turning a rotor. The nacelle rotates to face the wind, and the blades pitch to take full advantage of the wind's speed. The wind has been blowing across the top of these hills since the old boy put it together, so you know why not, why not capture it? It's, uh, you might better be using the wind where there's absolutely no pollution, or you have a few people at first complained about they didn't want them in their view shed, but this not-in-my-backyard attitude has to stop somewhere. We've got to get our energy from somewhere, and who are the first ones going to be that complain when the lights go out? There are wind farms in more than 30 states across the country, but the wind potential is mostly untapped. Experts say the U.S. could easily get a fifth of its electricity from wind. Well, you know, you could almost just like blindfold yourself and throw a dart at a, at a, a map on the wall and you'll uh, find a country that's doing better uh, in energy than America. Last year, Europe installed more than three times as much wind energy as the U.S. Denmark, a country that once used windmills to grind flour, now uses wind turbines to feed a fifth of its electricity needs. Far ahead of the U.S., where wind farms like Fenner and Madison make up less than 1% of all the generated electricity. To jumpstart wind energy production, national and state level incentives have been introduced. Congress created a tax credit for wind energy companies in 1992. It paid for about half of the electricity that wind projects produced. But the credit expired for the third time last December. Congress tried extending the credit period, but failed. Instead of having a steadily grow, growing curve, we're seeing uh, one, is, one that is more like a staircase with a very good year followed by a slow year. 2004 is going to be a slow year because of all of the uncertainty surrounding the extension. A lot of pent-up investments that are waiting to happen would have been moving forward, and right now they're just on hold. They'll stay on hold until the credit is extended. Without it, wind would have a hard time competing with lower cost conventional fuels. It really just levels the playing field. Uh, I mean, ideally we wouldn't have any kinds of, there would be no tax uh, credit supporting any kind of energy technology, but as it is, we've got to compete with uh, those existing sources that have been subsidized for a long time. 
Since the turn of the century, conventional fuels have benefited from billions of dollars in production subsidies and tax breaks. The long-term goal or the long-term policy should be not to massively subsidize wind power or any other form of renewable uh, environmentally appropriate power, but to desubsidize the dirty, polluting, uh, destructive energy forms of coal, oil, and gas. Fuels that also have indirect subsidies. An article in the journal Science said that wind power would actually be cheaper than coal if costs associated with global warming and respiratory problems were factored in. Some states have created Renewable Portfolio Standards, or RPS, short-term goals to have a certain amount of electricity come from renewables like wind. But only 15 states have some form of RPS. In Massachusetts, the goal is to be 5% renewable by 2010. But even such small numbers can be large challenges. When you run the numbers, it's pretty much impossible to come up with a scenario that says that we will be in compliance with the RPS mandate, you know, in, in say, year four, about three years in the future, uh, with the RPS, unless there is a wind project, particularly a wind project on the scale of Cape Wind, in the system. You know, that you just, the numbers just don't work without it. The Cape Wind project would put 130 windmills in Nantucket Sound, like this one in Denmark. The wind farm would make enough electricity for three of every four people in Cape Cod. Cape Wind President Jim Gordon. It's going to be a symbol of the future. And this country has got to break away from its dependence on fossil fuels and move to a more sustainable energy and environmental future. Projects like Cape Wind are going to uh, save and conserve and preserve far more wildlife and species, again through keeping an equivalent amount of fossil fuels in the ground, than they might threaten through their construction or operation. I mean, it's really, it's environmental trade-offs 101. Some environmentalists, lawmakers, and economists support implementing a tax on carbon. It is indispensable for solving our carbon and energy problems to tax the substance which is causing the problem, which is carbon or the use of carbon. Europe has made carbon taxes work since the 1990s. Now thousands of megawatts of electricity come from wind instead of fossil fuels. But here in the U.S., despite the tax credit and RPS, renewable electricity supply will have a hard time keeping up with rising demand. Or another way of putting it is that, that even though the renewable percentage of the pie will grow, the pie as a whole is going to be growing faster. And so the non-renewable share of the pie is still going to grow, and that's not good. Wind developers are working to make sure that's not going to happen. This is probably the center of what we're calling phase one, or the southern sector of the wind farm. And so we'll have a, three wind turbines right in this field. We'll probably have another uh, 30 or 40 wind turbines in this whole set of fields to the south, going about four miles to the south. And then, uh, and you can see some of those big open fields, those are perfect for, for wind turbines. This is Tug Hill. It's a windy plateau east of Lake Ontario, where Bill Moore plans to build 188 wind towers this summer. If built, it would be the largest wind farm in the country. All told, it could be a, a $10 million infusion into the local economy each year, and that's, that's a big number for, for a smaller rural townships. Another New York project is in the planning stages. The Long Island Power Authority is looking into supplying 30,000 homes with wind energy by installing a wind farm off Jones Beach. Construction there could start as early as next fall. And in Nantucket Sound, the Cape Wind project is close to being the first offshore wind farm in the U.S. And basically, uh, you get an idea of what they look like. Now, our wind turbines are going to be spaced much farther apart, approximately a third to a half a mile apart. But the project is not without opposition. Some Cape Cod residents argue the turbines will be too loud, kill birds, and ruin the scenic views from the beaches. Like now, you can't hear the wind turbine. All you can hear is wind. When it comes to bird deaths, wind turbines don't even compare to cats and windows. Neither the griffins nor the stones say they've seen a dead bird near the bases.
but misconceptions aside, the visual impact is unmistakable. Rising 25 stories in the air, these towers of power can be seen for miles away. The environmental damage that's resulting from our conventional generation of electricity is almost invisible at the local level. You don't really see global warming at the local level. You don't see acid rain at the local level. You will see the wind farm at the local level. And so we're kind of uh, having these, uh, we will be having these, these uh, fairly substantial visual impacts at the local level as part of the as part of the solution to the much more serious and long-term consequences of conventional fuel use. Something wind farmers like the Griffins and Stones hope future wind farmers will understand. And what saddens me, I think, is that as other projects are um, proposed around the country, we usually get calls from some of the landowners or some of the residents or whatever, but we usually get calls from the people that already like them. The people that don't like them have their minds made up and they don't want to be confused with facts. They say they're noisy. And I say, come, see them, hear them. They're not noisy. They're not ugly. They're beautiful, majestic, quiet machines that produce clean energy. What's wrong with that? I had one gentleman call and said, I need information from you to help me shoot this project down. Excuse me? Why? Come see them. Come visit them. Bonnie's husband, Carl, has sold a lot of things in his life. But selling wind is, as he says, mind-boggling. He wrote this poem and called it Winds of Change. The farmlands of our New York State are taking on a change. It all has happened just of late, and to most, it still looks strange. There is a brand new crop here now, like none we've ever seen. It isn't some new breed of cow, and it has no leaves of green. The crop that I now speak about has been with us all along. It's one we've never been without, its presence always strong. For years, I've always fought it, rarely considered it a friend, until this fella, he just bought it. Yeah, this guy, he bought my wind. So, now up from the fields of corn, Majestic towers rise, and mammoth rotors gently turn against the bright blue skies. It surely beats a plume of smoke polluting all our air. They stand as symbols to all folk to show that we must care. For years, we all have learned to take from this world placed in our hands. But now, for all our children's sake, we must make some long-term plans. So. Where will they finish with this thing? I suppose I'll never know. I just hope that guy drops by for spring. Maybe I can sell some snow.